System 7 is the new system software for the Macintosh. But why should an organization upgrade its users to System 7? And how should you manage that transition? I'm Chris Espinosa. I'm the marketing manager for system software in Apple USA. And I'm here to give you some reasons to upgrade to System 7, show you some tools to help you manage that transition, and give you guidelines on how to upgrade a group of users. There are two basic reasons to upgrade to System 7. One is that you can make every Macintosh in your organization more powerful and easier to use. And second, you'll be able to use the great new applications that require System 7. And you don't give up much because System 7 is compatible with the Macintosh computers, the networks, the applications, and the documents that you use today. And there are six basic steps to upgrading your organization. First, you plan the upgrade and decide who gets upgraded when. Second, you prepare the network environment and make sure all the Macintoshes you want to upgrade have two megabytes and a hard disk. Third is you ensure network-wide compatibility by upgrading everybody's laser writer drivers. Fourth is you create an upgrade station and install the System 7 software on that station. Users then upgrade from that station. Fifth, you monitor the status of the group upgrade and watch the users upgrade one by one. And sixth, you provide ongoing assistance to users as they upgrade and learn about System 7. We're providing you plenty of tools to help you, and I want to show you a couple of them. The first is the compatibility checker, which you use to check the compatibility of an individual Macintosh. It's a hypercard stack that comes on a floppy disk with every personal upgrade kit and group upgrade kit. What it does is it scans your hard disk and looks at your applications, fonts, utilities, and extensions and checks them against an internal compatibility database. The data in this database was reported to us by the software developers and it's the complete version number information and compatibility with System 7 that was valid as of the time that we created the personal upgrade kit. The compatibility checker scans through your disk and compares each file it finds to the internal database creating a final report. It also checks all of the system items to make sure that your Apple system software is compatible too. It gives you a personalized compatibility report that tells you some details of your system, for example, how many system files you have and where they are. It lists the applications and utilities it found that are incompatible and tells you their application vendors and their phone number. It lists the compatible applications it found so you can use them with confidence. And you can print this report to easily use it to upgrade your system and your applications. This is a great tool for individual users to use to check the compatibility of their system before upgrading to System 7. Now for Macintoshes on the network, you can use the network installer to upgrade each Macintosh. What you do is you set up an upgrade station with the System 7 software on it. Each user connects to the upgrade station using the chooser. They find the installer, double-click the installer, and it starts up the installer over the network. When they click the install button, the system software will be installed over the network onto their Macintosh. Now, it takes about three to five minutes to do an upgrade over a local talk network, and it only installs the system software, but the group upgrade kit includes upgrades to other Apple software, like the CD-ROM drivers. Once the installation is finished, you click the restart button, and you're up and running System 7. When you install System 7, you get a lot of powerful new capabilities for your Macintosh, not just in the system, but in your current applications as well. One of those is TrueType Outline Fonts. You can think of TrueType as a jaggy eliminator that makes all fonts look smooth on your screen and on your printer, whatever size you use. Now, one of the advantages of TrueType is that not only does it work with all your existing applications, but new applications can take advantage of its powers with new user interfaces. For example, in this application, I can select a piece of text and I can make it any size I want by choosing the size from the text menu. And the text looks good in all sizes I choose. But this application also has a new user interface feature where if I want to make the text fit the box, 
I don't have to do trial and error of different type sizes. I simply drag the text out until it's the size I want it to be, and it picks the type size for me. So with TrueType, not only do you get smooth type in all your current applications, but new applications also make it easier to work with type. And that's the real importance of TrueType. When using System 7 and its powerful new capabilities, you might want some help in finding your way around. Luckily, help is built into System 7 and new System 7 applications with Balloon Help. To turn Balloon Help on, you go to the new help menu and choose Show Balloons. Now, anything you point to will bring up a help balloon that tells you what that icon, scroll bar, window, or document is. So I can browse through this new version of Excel and see what the new tools in the toolbar are. When I turn help balloons off, the help balloons go away. Now this works throughout the system, not just in new applications. For example, I can bring up the control panels turn on the help balloons and I can see one by one what each new control panel is help is not a mode it doesn't restrict me from using the computer so I can open up a control panel see what the parts of it are, and actually use the system while I'm learning, and learn the system while I'm using it. With System 7, Macintosh users can automatically share information over the network using two new features, Publish and Subscribe, and File Sharing. For example, I'll take this chart I've created in Excel. I'll select it, but instead of copying it to the clipboard, I'll go to the Edit menu. I choose Create Publisher from the Edit menu. I type a name for the chart and select a shared folder on my hard disk, a folder other people have access to. When I publish it to that folder, my colleagues on the network now have access to the information there. And from their computers and other applications, for example, word processors, they can go to their edit menu, choose subscribe to, connect to my computer, type their own passwords, find the chart, and incorporate it into their documents. So it's like network copy and paste. But it's more than that because a live link is maintained between her machine and my machine. When I go back to my machine and make a change in my information and I save those changes, the chart in her document is automatically updated over the network. So it's live sharing of information over the network between Macintosh users. Some of the best of System 7 happens when you use two features together. I'm going to show you two new features, file sharing and the alias mechanism, that together give you the very powerful ability to carry your office with you wherever you go. Right now, my computer in my office is using file sharing. That means other people in my office can connect to it and share files with me even when I'm not there. But it also means that I can get back to my computer from any other computer on the network. And I do it using the chooser the same way I get at a file server or another shared device. I select Apple Share in the chooser and I find my zone where my computer is located. And there I see my computer along with all of the other file servers in the building. I select my computer, type my password, and I can place the hard disk from my computer 
on the desktop of this one. When I open it up, I can see all of the files, folders, documents, my appointment calendar, utility programs that I need with me wherever I go. Now that's nice, but I don't want to have to remember all of that chooser and zones and servers bit. So the Macintosh can remember that for me with a mechanism called aliases. I can select this hard disk and choose Make Alias from the file menu. And I get another icon that looks just like the original, but it's not a copy of it. It's a pointer to it. It remembers where the original is. And I can use the alias just like I use the original. I can even put the alias on a floppy disk. So if I travel around to other Apple locations, such as to our facility in Charlotte, North Carolina, I can get one-click access to the files in my office. Say I'm in North Carolina and want to get a memo on the computer back in my office. I put the floppy disk in any System 7 machine I find there on the network. I double-click the alias. I type my password. And my entire office comes up on my screen. So with the combination of file sharing and the alias mechanism, I get one-click access to all of my files back in my office. Hi, I'm Chris Espinosa. I'm the System Software Marketing Manager in Apple USA, and I'm here to give you a competitive comparison of System 7 on a Macintosh 2 SI to Windows 3.0 on an IBM PS2 Model 7386. I'm going to do the comparison in five areas. First, sharing, migration paths, applications, subscribe and publish, and help in the user interface. And I'm going to show you the features that are only on a Macintosh that'll help you smash Windows. Macintosh has file sharing built in with the famous Macintosh ease of use. So if I wanted to share some information with somebody else in my organization, on a Macintosh with System 7, I'd simply use the Sharing Setup Control Panel and click this button to start file sharing. If I wanted to give them controlled access to various parts of my hard disk, I would use the Users and Groups control panel. I'd go to the File menu, choose New User, type that user's name, and then that user would have privileges on my computer to share information with them. I simply click the folder I want to share, go to the File menu again, choose Sharing, Click this checkbox, choose the user to share it with, and then that user will have access to all of the documents and applications in that folder over the network. I don't have to use a central file server. So Macintosh has file sharing between users built in and only on a Macintosh. Windows has networking capabilities as well that you access through the Windows Setup control panel in Windows. By choosing Change System Setting from the Options menu, you can look at the range of networks that Windows is compatible with. But these are DOS-based networks, which means you can only use file sharing, and you must install them using DOS. And when you go to the Windows File Manager, even if you're connected to a network, there's no sharing option available in the Windows File Menu. So Windows may give you network access but it's DOS network access, and there's no file sharing available. Let's talk about the migration path. Since 1984, Macintosh has offered a smooth growth without disruption. We haven't changed that, even with System 7. I have here on my Macintosh two applications that I've been using for more than two years. 
And even though they were written for System 6 under System 7, I can start them up and they work just fine. But not only are they compatible with System 7, they can even take advantage of some of the new features of System 7, such as TrueType, Outline Fonts, and Virtual Memory and Multitasking. So only on a Macintosh do you get a clean migration path without disruption. But growth in the DOS and Windows world hasn't been nearly so easy. Because of all the competing standards with DOS and Windows hardware and applications, it's been very hard to maintain compatibility, even from Windows 2 to Windows 3. If you look at older applications under Windows, the incompatibility rate is so high that there's even a standard warning that comes up every time you try to run a Windows 2 application. And one of the great advantages of Windows is supposedly you can run DOS applications in a window under multitasking, but when you actually try to do it, for example, run 123 version 3.1 in a window under Windows, the incompatibilities with the memory managers and other applications running often don't let you do what you want to do. So growth in the DOS and Windows world has been very disruptive. Only on a Macintosh can you get thousands of consistent applications that work well together. There are over 3,500 applications available for the Macintosh, while Windows users get a choice of fewer than 1,000. And while there are many applications that run on both the Macintosh and the Windows platform, the Macintosh applications are generally higher performance and can take advantage of more of the features of the Macintosh system software. For example, let's look at PowerPoint from Microsoft, available on both Macintosh System 7 and on Windows 3. But the Macintosh version, running on System 7, can take advantage of the TrueType outline fonts built in to System 7 for smooth type at any size. And when you use the slideshow capability, the performance is much higher than its Windows equivalent. In fact, Ingram Micro D research shows that tasks are generally completed faster on a Macintosh than on a Windows 3 machine. Let's look at the Windows version of PowerPoint now. Because Microsoft Windows doesn't have built-in outline fonts, when I choose a piece of text and choose a type style that's not installed in the machine, I get jaggy type. And when I use the slideshow feature of Microsoft PowerPoint, it takes longer to go from slide to slide than it does on the Macintosh, even though I've set the two computers to the same setting. So you can clearly see the Macintosh advantage in applications over Windows. Higher performance, more applications, and more features. Only on a Macintosh can you use networked publish and subscribe to share information among users. For example, using these new applications, I can select a chart, choose Create Publisher from the Edit menu, and I can save this chart on a networked file server. I have a folder here on this file server where I share information with other people in my group. And I will publish this chart to that file server. Now other users in my group using their different Macintoshes and different applications can get access to that chart by going to their application and choosing subscribe from the edit menu. They see the chart, click subscribe, and they get a copy of the information from my document. And there's a live link between mine and theirs. So when I go back and make changes to my document,
when I save those changes, all of the people who are subscribing to my document are updated automatically. This lets me share information over a network with other users. Windows has a functionality called Dynamic Data Exchange, or DDE, but it only works in a few applications, and it doesn't have the power that Network Publish and Subscribe has. With DDE, I can select a chart and choose Copy from the Edit menu in an application. Then I can switch over to another application on the same machine and choose Paste Link. I have to click the Auto Update button in order to get automatically updated. And when I change information in the original application, the information is automatically updated in the other document. But I don't have any control over this, and I can't do it over a network. So you can see how while DDE looks like Network Publish and Subscribe, it's only implemented in a few applications, and it's not nearly as powerful. One of the things people love about the Macintosh is the way it helps them get their work done, rather than getting in the way. For example, if I want to do something very simple, like save this memo. If I forget what all these save options are, I can use the balloon help feature of System 7 to find out. I choose show balloons, point at an item I don't know about, and it tells me what it does. I can also name the file a sensible name with spaces and punctuation. And when I leave the application, the document is where I expected to be on my hard disk. Using System 7, if I want even easier access to it, I can take the document, drag it to the Apple Menu Items folder, and it appears instantly in my Apple Menu. I simply choose it, and I get right back to the document. So with very few mouse strokes and very little work, I can get at any document I want, and the Macintosh helps me get my work done. Windows, on the other hand, is not nearly so helpful. For example, if I want to create a short memo, when I go to save it, if I forget what these controls are, the help menu is disabled. I need to remember that the help function is the F1 key. And the help system actually covers up my work, so I can't see what I've got a question about. I have to leave the help system to go back to my work. I'll try to type a long file name here. When I save it, I get an error saying, not a valid file name, though the help system didn't tell me what a valid file name was. I have to remember that DOS file names are limited to eight characters, uppercase only, and no spaces. So I'll create a cryptic document name and save it. And I have to fill out other options. When I quit this application, I get a long list of other documents, and it's very hard to find my new document in them. And the file name has been changed for me. This isn't really an icon, and Microsoft Windows lets me turn it into an icon with the Program Manager. I can drag this document from here to here in the Program Manager, when I open it up, I get a document. But if I move the original 
to a different folder. The icon I've created doesn't work. That's because the program manager and the file manager don't communicate, and you have to do that work for Windows. So while Macintosh helps you get your work done, you have to help Windows.